Welcome back everyone to SuperCloud 22. This is theCUBE's live presentation, streaming out virtually our inaugural event, kind of a pilot. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante. Got a great panel here to discuss the enablers and blockers, question mark, for SuperCloud. We got, we got Kit Colbert, CTO of VMware, Bhaskar Gorty, CEO of Platform9, and Haseeb Puthani, who is the CEO of Rafi Systems. Uh, we got a mix of the big leader, VMware, and the upstart companies growing into the same space, all cloud native friends of theCUBE. Great to see you guys, thanks for coming on. Thank, Thank you for having us. All right, so there's no debate, cloud native is booming, we see that <coughs> clearly. Kubernetes became a unifying force, it's an ops layer, kind of almost like a, kind of a midline between dev and ops. DevSecOps is happening at scale. What are the blockers and what are the enablers for SuperCloud? What do we need? Let's see, what is your take? Sure, so uh, you and I spoke about this a little bit in, at New York Summit. Um, the big trend I'm seeing, and it's, it's a blocker that's being sort of taken care of by enterprises, which is, you know, till very recently, Kubernetes was effectively a project that uh, an app team would take on. They'd try things out, they'd go to the cloud, they'd spin things up. And then the next team would come and they'd do the same things and there was no consistency, there was no standardization. It's a mess, right? It's all over the place. Some things are moving fast, some things are not moving fast. And this is not how enterprises do business. Right? That's not how things work. Traditionally, enterprises have had IT organizations that create standards, right? So those IT organizations now kind of are starting to think like a platform organization. So centrally come up with the right framework for all application teams to consume uh, infrastructure, modern infrastructure. So I'm not using the word Kubernetes here because Kubernetes is an enabler. We are a Kubernetes company, obviously, but it's about modern applications, modern infrastructure. So stepping back and thinking about it as to how an enterprise will do this across the board is the right answer. And I'm seeing this happen in a pretty significant way across all the large enterprises I talk to. That's right, you've had a great career and we talked before you came on, Nokia, yeah. you did a turnaround there. Uh, we even go back to the old days of the web, web 1.0 and early software, you've seen the movie before. Yes. You know, complexity is not solved by more complexity. And this is kind of the old enterprise way and they don't want that. They've seen the benefits of self-service. They see architecture and standards as, as being an enabler. Where are we in here in the market? Is, are we positioned in your opinion for customers to get the value of a super cloud? Absolutely, so if you think about, first of all, I think the topic of cloud native developers and app developers picking containers and Kubernetes, that's a done deal, right? That has already happened. So every cloud native developer is already using these tools. Now, I think as has been discussed today and even the earlier sessions, is are the operations and infrastructure catching up or they are lagging behind, right? As more and more developers are using multi-cloud technologies, enterprises are creating a choice. Um, I think operations, and what we also strongly believe, that's actually part of the name of our company, is, is a platform. The platform of which a company uses to transform itself to be cloud native is the big opportunity. I don't think it's a blocker, but it's a huge opportunity. And I think this is where, you know, as you can't stop developers from developing on different yeah. clouds, private, public, multi, edge, that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Innovation is going to continue. But then how does the infrastructure and the platform make it seamless, right? And almost treat all these different clouds as a single pane super cloud platform. That's I think is the so opportunity. So we in a platform war then with other companies or with there one unified platform called Cloud Native. Um, we know customers have been buying tools from security. Sure. They got so many tools in, the, in their tool shed, so to speak. Um, what is that platform? I mean, is it more Unique fragmentation, is it unified? I mean, if you think about it, a couple of, it's a combination of tools that are stitched together uh, to reach a purpose, right? So if you think about you know, APIs, container APIs, that's been discussed earlier today. I think that's, that should be standardized. The other thing is always on monitoring because I think that's a very key aspect. Once you build it, then as the enterprises are using it, the always on monitoring becomes. So I think it's a combination of capabilities that are stitched together to enable the acceleration for companies to become cloud native. I, I have a thought on a blocker. None of you guys are going to like it. Uh -oh. Maybe you can comment. Maybe some of you guys <laughs> probably won't put comment, but maybe John will. I think AWS is a blocker to super cloud because they, they don't want that, those cross cloud services. That's mm. like, they, they, for years they wouldn't even say multi cloud. The first time I heard it was in Boston three weeks I ago. You. I actually heard it. So, hey, you, see, you know, you know, what you, you know I'm going to disagree with that. So okay, but, but okay. okay, go ahead. All right, so yeah, we'll but, get their reaction. <laughs> so, my, we just heard from the last panel that the security, AWS should be leading 
the consortium um, yeah. because they're they're not the enemy. They're actually an maybe they should too. be. But well, back in the old web days when standards were driving things, you had a common enemy: proprietary NASAs, proprietary networking stacks. So the evil empire was AT and T, that owned Unix. If you remember, so you, they copyrighted. So you think they're greasing the skids for uh, I think, super I cloud? Think, I think the hyperscalers could because they're driving the capex. They're providing the value. So in my opinion. Amazon and Azure, whoever does the right thing first can win everything. Maybe this is how Google could catch up. It, it could be a, it could be a slingshot <laughs> move. It could you know boomerang someone to the front of the line or extend Amazon's already huge lead. So if I'm AWS, if I'm Adam Slavsky and, and I'm talking to Andy Jassy, he says, how am I going to differentiate myself? I'd say, I'm going to come in and own multi-cloud. I'm going to own super cloud. We are the super cloud. And you work with AWS's primitives in a way that makes services work. I would go for that. I'd be like, okay, show me more. What do you think? I, I don't think any one company is going to be a super cloud because I think, yes, there is going to be a lot of workloads on public clouds, but there's a huge amount of workloads at the enterprise, at the edge, at the store. I think those will continue for various reasons, whether it's data sovereignty, regulations. So I think it's going to be a combination. Everybody's not going to go to one you know, cloud. It's going to be an amalgamation. Okay, but I, I've argued that Snowflake is a form of a super data cloud in a very specific use case. You know, Aviatrix is trying to be a network you know, layer um, and you know, Sneak in a security, I mean, on and on and on. There are a lot of s small, so, so now what you get is, Yep. You get super cloud stovepipes, but but nonetheless, you're you're still abstracting. I mean, we this industry is abstractions, right? Well, this uh, this concept, I completely agree with, right? This idea that I, so so one of the my theses is that right now enterprises buy 500 different technologies and they have to become PhDs in 500 different things. Mm -hmm. It's just never going to happen. Skills issue. There's no way, right? Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen is all of these providers are going to essentially become managed service providers. Cloud is a manifestation of that, Snowflake is a manifestation of that, Databricks is a manifestation of that, right? So in our general industry, there's going to be a handful of platforms, right? And they're going to work across these clouds. Amazon may have one too, right? Look, they, they, they for the longest time sort of ignored on-prem, but now they have something called EKSA, which runs on-prem, right? Why? Why would they bother? Because, well, obviously there's a lot of money to be made in a data center as well. So I, my sense is they get it, completely understand and appreciate that there's other things outside of Amazon. Uh, but in terms of what Bosco was talking about, I mean, my sense is uh, you know, these multiple platforms will come about. And to the point you were making earlier about standardization, and I, I mean, is it going to be one company or is it going to be standards that everybody will, else will adopt? Um, uh, there's a topic that the three of us have talked about before, which is this vCenter for Kubernetes, right? And all due respect to Kit, right? My sense is that uh, there, uh, there's going to be multiple companies that are going to start working towards a vCenter for Kubernetes, and it is, right? I mean, that's how I've, I mean, I've been thinking about this for four and a half years. Um, Including VMware. Yeah, yeah right. and, you know, <laughs> and, and we, we should compare notes, right? But uh, what's going to happen right is there was, a, there was a distinct advantage VMware had back in the day because ESX was their product, right? And that was the standard. Right now, what's the ESX in the new world? It's sort of Kubernetes, right? I mean, it's it, on bare metal for the most part or whatever VMs. So that's a standard, that's got standardized APIs. The things around it are standardized APIs. So what is the unfair advantage that any one company has other than execution? Nothing. Well, also composability. If you over-rotate on Kubernetes, for example, and not take advantage of, say, EC2, for instance. Totally, totally. Can, it's a mix and match. Absolutely. Yeah, but I think, I think if you get too focused on Kubernetes, it's a means to an end. Yeah. Right? At the end of the yeah. day, it, it's a means to an end, and I think all these tools, there's a lot of standardization happening. That's going to happen, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and no one vendor is going to control that, right? It's, it's, going to be, it's going to continue. I think how you bring these together and orchestrate Right, and manage a service, because I think that, if you think about the lack of skills to keep up with the operations and platforms is one of the largest inhibitors right now for enterprises to move as fast as they want to become cloud native. And you have the shiny new toy problem, Kit, yeah. where people just go out and grab it. You know, Keith Townsend has a, has a quote, he says, look, we essentially move at the speed of the CIO or else we're going too fast or too slow. So, uh, so the, <laughs> you know, to, to the point about the new toy, now I've got new skills. Yep. Well, <clears throat> so this has been a really good discussion. I think, so there's a couple of things, right? Going back to the, the paper that we wrote, right? <clears throat> How we have these different sort of layers of multi-cloud services or, or categories of multi-cloud services. And it's exactly the capture of some of the ex different examples you just mentioned. And yeah, the challenge is that each of them by themselves are a little bit of an island today. Like, <clears throat> you don't have that extra level of integration. And so what the platform teams typically do is try to add that extra glue to make the experience more seamless for uh, the, the, the you know, developers at that company. And so like, you know, for instance, things like identity. 
So the nice thing about going to a single public cloud is that there's one, usually one identity system for everything. And that's great, all the different services. Uh, roles are, are uh, <clears throat> you know, RBAC, all that stuff's all centralized. But you don't have that when you're going across many different multi-cloud services. So what does that look like? So I think there's some of these different cross-cutting concerns that we need to look at how we standardize on as an industry. And that's, what, again, one of the We've solved that problem, and, and, by the way. and I think, I think also the other key thing is, yes, you can always say, I'll put everything in one wall, wall garden and I'm done. Yeah. Okay, but that's not the reality because at some point you need the flexibility and cost comes into play and flexibility to move comes into play. And I think yep. that is a key factor. Yep. Right? <clears throat> yeah, and so like, so then the question is, what degrees of freedom do you give yourself there? And I think that's the architectural question. Is how, you, how do you design it? What sort of abstractions do you leverage? And I think that goes back to some of our discussion before, which is do you directly go on top of a native cloud service or do you use a multi-cloud service? And, but I think it's a combination. Of, I don't think it's an either or. No, it's not. It's not an either or. Right. You have to have the ability to choose a public cloud or do it private, yeah, it but at the same the time you don't change. It's like a common yeah. dictionary, right? You're not going to change every time the yeah. accent changes. You know, so that's, okay, I think that's, so here's a question for you guys. So what has to happen for super clouds to be existing? Assume that AWS and Azure and Google aren't going to sit still. Assume that maybe they normalize into yeah. some sort of swim lane or position that they have to rationalize. Uh, um, what, assuming they're not going to sit still, what has to happen for super clouds to, to actually work well? Well, I think, you know, really quick, <clears throat> going back to the platform team point, I would say that the platform teams at various companies, and we got one at VMware too, they are creating a rudimentary form of a super cloud, <laughs> right? Because they, you know, <clears throat> like yeah. if, if they are supporting multiple clouds, like all the things they're stitching together and all that work, that is a super cloud. The problem is that there's not really a standard approach or architecture or reusable things to enable that. I think that's really what's missing. Yeah, but so, I think the key here is standard use, reusable because for example, we have customers who are on, doesn't matter where they are. Some of their loads are in public cloud, some yep. are in private, some are at the edge, but they're still using the same platform, yep. right? So it is a standard open source based technology. So it is standard, there's no lock-in for them from an infrastructure point of view. Yep. And it gives them the flexibility because certain apps you want to put on the public cloud, certain apps <coughs> you do not, you need the, I mean for example, some of the AI, I think earlier discussion that was going on about chips and AI and ML yep. workloads. I mean think about moving all of that to a public cloud to, and I think a lot of machine learning and AI applications are going to happen where the data is getting created. At the edge, yeah. At the edge, that's yeah, where it's going to happen. Cloud. It's, it's not going to happen It's going to be real time cloud. inferencing. It's, it's going to be real time. So, and so therefore, you have to decide based on your workload, what are you going to move all the way to a public cloud? And what do you need to do to make business decisions at the spot where the data is created? That's a huge disruptor potentially to super cloud. This is a whole new architecture that emerges at the edge with a whole new set of economics. I think the edge is going to be like massively disruptive. I, mean, and, yeah. and I think it's going to be. If you think about the edge, go beyond just the classic definition of edge. Think about branches and stores, retail stores. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you cannot shut down a retail store because you lost connectivity to the network or something. You still have to serve your customers. Yeah. Edge is a disruptive enabler. I think it's going to change, potentially change the, the position of the players in the business. Whoever embraces the edge. Yeah, exactly. maybe going back to the question that you had asked before, which is what is what is the framework for a server, uh, super cloud? So you said something that is important, which is your team's building one. Yeah, I met that team actually. Uh, they seem to be very sharp yeah, guys. They're, they're, on my, they're in my yeah. org, yeah, they're great. They're awesome. Um, they're to <laughs> we got a deal going on here, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I tried to tell them We have it. So. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the interesting part, right? So I will posit that the super cloud of the future will be a company that owns zero servers and no network, okay? Uh, that's going to happen, right? So I just kind that's of full negated the point you made the before, right? Yeah. I made that point just that's so- About the public cloud. Just yeah. so Mr. Yeah, 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 yeah. no, cloud, that's right? a really so, interesting thought. We so like that. I've thought about this a long time that in my opinion, and I've, I th I'm, I'm sure I've said this to you, John, that you know the one company that I've always believed has the best shot at doing this well is actually VMware, because that's the one company that's you know that there, there's there's no you know infrastructure backhaul right you know that you're carrying, uh, but but in terms of thinking and getting there, you know being being a company that can do it is not the same as being the company who has done it. There's a, there's a sure. distance. But I have to defend right? that now yeah. because hyperscalers <clears throat> are not going to build the super cloud. They're not. Now, type, huh. so, see, pr agreed, agreed. That's agreed. Point. Uh, uh, yeah. pri public yeah. clouds will be part of the super yeah. clouds. Yeah, totally. Yes. But they totally. will not, the hyperscalers yeah. are not building super clouds. Totally. They're blocking right? it. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I don't, I mean, no, but no, they're agree. enabling yeah. it. Right, we agree on that. No, yeah, they're absolutely enabling agree it. Because the, it's, it's not in there to their advantage, right? Look, the, the Snowflake example you gave is the pivotal example yeah. in this conversation, yep. right? Why does Snowflake exist at all? 
when Redshift exists and all these other things exist because they provide value that is beyond a single cloud's yeah. purview, yeah. right? And at that point, just step back from our platforms and what we sell. Forget about that for a minute, right? It's it's about look. I think I think this we are this market is early. We're all early, right? Ten years from now. What will a company look like that actually solves the super cloud problem? They're going to solve for, yeah, Kubernetes, whatever, right? But they're going to solve for truly modern applications. Yeah, they're going to refactor an right. application that has new economics, new exactly, value. Exactly, right? On At that point, this idea of edge and cloud, forget about it, right? This is all distribution issues, right? It doesn't really matter. Is it retail or not? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely, these are places. But, but the way, the right way to think about this is not about edge versus cloud, right? This is about an app. Sometimes it needs to run in one location and it's good enough. Sometimes it needs to run in 10,000 locations. And, and it's a distribution issue. I've always believed this, this idea of edge versus cloud, this is BS, right? Because it, I think it's, it's, it's a, a cloud of a different size. Sure, <laughs> but, but I'm making a slightly different point, sure. um, which is it's a distribution problem, right? If you step back and think about distribution, my app could run in Azure or AWS or in a retail store or in a branch or whatever, right? And once that is done, the question is, how am I in, in making all this happen? There was a point made in the prior conversation, in the, in the prior session, about a database kind of popping up in the place where I needed to run. Okay, nobody does that today, by the way, right? At least truly well, yeah, right? We want that, sir. that will come, right? Yeah. But when that comes, my application is a conglomerate of compute, yeah. uh, data, I don't know, a, a, a service bus and network and all these things, and they will all kind of pop together. That company does not exist today. Well, we'll we will be documenting. Wish we had more time. We're going to document We have to, unfortunately, yeah. stop this panel because it's awesome. We can go for another hour. Sure. Um, let's bring you guys back, but that's it. The super cloud of the future will look like something, and we're going to debate it. And speaking of Snowflake, we have the co-founder, Benoit, here next to sit down with us to talk about, what he thinks about super cloud. <laughs> he probably heard the comment. Come back more coverage after this break with the co-founder of Snowflake after this short break. <laughs> Forget to do the thing too.